I had just graduated from college when I landed my dream job as a sports writer at ESPN. Every day I went to work, I watched sports and got paid to talk about them. Baseball, basketball, hockey, football, boxing, tennis, golf, MMA, croquet, ping pong, whatever it was, I was on it. And it was an awesome experience. I traveled across the country covering games live on location. I met a lot of cool athletes. I was making some money. I had a great job. I was going out on the weekends with my friends. I was dating. I had everything that the world told me that I should have. But every night, I would come home from work and I would stare at the ceiling and wonder why I was so unhappy. See, I had everything in life, everything except God. There is no happiness in this life apart from God's will. And I had known since I was 15 years old that I was called to the priesthood. But I thought I could make myself happy apart from God's will. I thought I could say no to God's plan for my life and still be happy. See, if I just worked a little harder, if I just made a little more money, if I just got sent on a bigger assignment, if I just got a few more followers on social media, if I just tried harder, then I would find happiness. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work like that. Happiness is only found in understanding what God's will for is for our lives and doing it. And one of the reasons I said no to my calling as a priest for so long, for 14 years I said no to God. One of the reasons was I misunderstood what the priesthood is. I was like Jeremiah in our first reading today. I let myself be duped. See, growing up, I saw the priest saying mass, and I thought that the priesthood was this life of no. No, you can't get married. No, you can't have a family. No, you can't travel. No, you can't make any money. No, 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 no. Who would want to live a life of no? It wasn't until God intervened in my life in a dramatic way that I started to see the priesthood for what it really is. The priesthood is not a life of no. It is the great yes. Yes, Lord, you can have my whole life, my mind, my body, my soul, my masculinity, my fatherhood, my strengths, my weaknesses, my past, my present, my future, all of me, Lord, everything I am, I make a total gift of myself to you. I lay my life on the altar so that you can do with me what you will. Yes, Lord. The great yes. But I didn't see that at first. Instead, God had to break into my life. He had to break my heart, break my grip on the world, my, my grip on the world so that I could see the priesthood in my life for what it really is. I was abruptly fired from my job at ESPN in a high profile incident in which I was falsely accused of writing a racial slur. Overnight, I went from being one who writes about sports to being the biggest story in sports. I got hate mail and death threats from all over the world. Every website, blog, newspaper, all the late night talk shows were talking about me and how evil I am. What a villain I was. Saturday Night Live did a skit about me. It was the darkest, most awful experience of my life. Feeling the hatred from people all over the world for something that I didn't do. 
And it was in that darkness, in that experience of having my dreams for my life shattered so that God's plan for my life to come to fulfillment, it was in that darkness that I did something that I hadn't done for a long time. I walked into St. Francis Cabrini Catholic Church in North Haven, where I'm from, and I knelt in front of the tabernacle, and I said, I know you've been calling me. I'm ready to say yes. I stand before you now as a priest of Jesus Christ, as one who has said yes to the Lord's plan for my life. And I have nothing that the world values. I have no fame. I have no money. I have no following. And friends, I have never been happier in my whole life. See, now I have nothing in life except God. And in God, I have found happiness that surpasses anything that I ever tasted when I was in the world. I have deep, peace inside, which does not change when the circumstances of life change. In order for me to have this transition of one who was successful but miserable to one now who is poor and happy, I had to change my thinking. See, the Christian life is a belief first before it is actions. See, we all try to be good people first. We wonder why we can't escape patterns of sin. The Christian life starts in the mind, in what we believe, in what we think, and then it's translated into our actions. Look at our gospel today. Jesus offers a serious rebuke to Peter. But look at what he says to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as the world does. You are thinking wrong, Peter. He doesn't say, Peter, you didn't put enough money in the basket this weekend. He doesn't say, Peter, I saw those sins that you're still struggling with. You really got to get on top of that. He doesn't say, Peter, you're spending way too much time on your phone. Nothing physical, nothing social, nothing in the world. It's not related to behavior. He says, Peter, you are not thinking correctly. The Christian life is a belief system first. Friends, what do you believe about God? Look at this comparison. When Peter betrayed Jesus, right? He denied him three times. He betrayed him in Jesus' dramatic hour of need. What is Jesus' response to that? Compassion, mercy, embraces him, brings him back, gives him three chances to renew his faith, right? But when Peter thinks wrongly, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It's our thinking, friends, that we have to challenge. It's our mindset. It's what we believe. Our behavior will follow after that. First, we have to change what we think. And how do we do that? How do we change our mindset? Well, St. Paul tells us today in our second reading, do not conform yourselves to this present age, but be renewed by the transformation of your mind. Do not conform yourselves to this present age. Friends, do you know how many hours a day the average American spends scrolling through their phone? Five hours a day. Do you know how many hours a day the average American spends on the computer, on the internet, Netflix, TV, watching TV? An additional four hours per day. That's nine of our 16 waking hours of the day being influenced and saturated by the world's mindset, the world's thinking, the world's values. The average American checks his or her phone 144 times a day, constantly connected to the world's logic. 
the world's materialism, the world's relativism, the world's sexual immorality, the world's paganism. Do not conform yourselves to this present age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. If you want to start changing your thinking in order to have this new, powerful experience of God, throw your phone in a river. Delete social media. Do not conform yourself to this age. Friends, it's all lies. There's some goodness, and we can use these things responsibly, but many of us have failed to use these things responsibly and instead have injected ourselves with the world's mindset. You want more of God? Change your relationship with media. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You are not thinking as God does, but as men do. Friends, when I started thinking differently, when I got serious about my prayer life, here was, here was my prayer life before I got serious with God. All right, it's time for bed. I haven't thought of God all day today, so I really should pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We can come and live on earth as in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed art thou among Jesus, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, I prayed today. I said, an Our Father and a Hail Mary. Friends, when you commit to daily prayer, it doesn't have to be a long time. Start with 10 minutes per day. When you give God your undivided attention for 10 minutes every day, your life will change. When you commit to a lifestyle of daily prayer, I love how we have to use the phrase, make time for prayer. We don't make time for prayer, we make time for the world. Prayer is that which we build our day around, not which we jam in after we've given all of our attention and energy and emotion to the world. If you give God the fullness of your energy in your daily emotional life in prayer, your life will change because your thinking will start to change. And from when your thinking changes, your actions will change. And when your actions change, you will become a new creation in Christ. Change your thinking. Everything else will follow. I stand before you now as the vocations director of the Archdiocese of Hartford. I visit every church, every parish in our archdiocese. I visit every middle school, every high school, every college, every young adult gathering, and I tell people the story of what the Lord has done in my life. And I ask if you would dream with me about a new future for our, our, our archdiocese. We all know about the dreadful statistics of people leaving the church, about the crisis of vocations. We all know about that. But what I want to know about is what God is going to do next in the Archdiocese of Hartford. See, I trust in the faithfulness of the living God. I see glimpses of the new movement of the Holy Spirit everywhere I go. And friends, I am dreaming of a glorious future for our local church. I dreamed of packed churches, standing room only at every Mass. I dream of people coming back to the Catholic faith by the thousands. I dream of hundreds and thousands of people being received into the church as converts every Easter. I dream of children running up and down the aisles as families start practicing the faith again. Churches that are basically daycares for so many kids. Will you dream with me on this future for the Archdiocese of Hartford? Will you trust that God is doing something exciting in our midst? Will you change your thinking about what it means to be Catholic? I don't want your money. I don't want your credit card information. What I want you to do is go to hartfordpriest.com and sign your name, that you will be part of the future, that you dream of better days for our church, that you're not satisfied with where we're at right now. I don't want anything from you but to go to hartfordpriest.com and to sign your name to commit to being part of the future. That's all I ask. Jesus tells us clearly how to get the renewal that we need in the church, how to get the vocations that we need in the church. He tells us in Matthew 9:38 how to get the priests that we need. It's very simple. Ask. 
the master of the harvest, to send out laborers for his harvest. To get the vocations that we need, we have to ask, which is why we're praying the prayer for priestly vocations throughout the archdiocese. You know that prayer we pray at the end of Mass for priestly vocations? Since we've started praying that prayer as an archdiocese, 24 young men have called the vocations office to begin. <laughs> Praise God, right? Incredible number of young men have started calling the vocations office to begin discerning because we're asking intentionally. And that Greek word for ask, ask the master of the harvest, that Greek word there is deomahi. It means to beg in the original Greek, to beg. The full definition is to beg from a place of desperate urgency. Desperate urgency. Does that describe the state of our church today, friends? Yes. And so every night I go before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and I beg him to send us the renewal in our church. I beg us to send him new priests. But I am not begging the Lord for one new priest or two or ten. I am begging the Lord for a thousand new priests for the Archdiocese of Hartford, and a thousand new deacons, and a thousand new religious sisters, and a thousand new Catholic marriages, and a thousand new consecrated virgins. I stand before you as a beggar. Will you join me? You know, I, I go to every church in the parish in the archdiocese and I, say, I make the same appeal, asking people simply to sign their name, to be part of the prayer warrior community that's praying for the future of the archdiocese, just to sign their name. And most people at the churches I visit, most of them ignore me. I would guess about two to three percent of the people who hear me make this appeal sign their name. This morning I was at a mass, zero people signed up. That's okay, because beggars are used to being ignored. When you see a person on the side of the road holding a sign, need food, homeless, will work, that person is used to being ignored because a beggar realizes that I can no longer help myself. I cannot fix myself. I am totally dependent on the needs of others. Friends, as a beggar, I want us all to realize together that we are totally dependent on the Lord for the renewal of our local church. We are totally dependent on the Lord for an infusion of new voca vocations for the life of the church. We cannot fix ourselves anymore. We cannot help ourselves. So if you want to stay in the old mindset with the world's thinking that I'll just say a couple prayers and everything will get better, you're welcome to do that. But if you have a hunger to see God glorified among the nations, and if you want to see our Catholic Church restored to its previous glory, I simply ask you to go to HartfordPriest.com to sign your name that you will be part of the future of the Archdiocese. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind.